Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Andrei uh, Rybalchenko, who's uh, visiting from Max Planck Institute and LPFL Lausanne. He'll be talking about path invariance. Yeah, thank you. So it's about path invariance and it's about software verification. And we know there, there exist these very successful tools like BLAST and SLAM, and they have very sophisticated heuristics to come up with the right abstraction. And that's at the heart of the applicability. But unfortunately, there are there are many programs in which these tools fail, and like very simple example is like if you need some some complicated arithmetic reasoning, some uh, disjunctive invariance, then the this tool won't help you. Or if you need to the reason about some unbounded areas and have universal quantification in the predicates, then again this tool will fail. And if you start to apply in them, you will see just ongoing sequence of refinement steps where they will unroll the loops and compute some ongoing sequence of predicates and will will just will not stop. And in this talk I'm first I'm going to briefly present you like what's what's going on in these tools and present our contributions how we want to improve state of the art in the abstraction discovery and an algorithm that can be applied in the conjunction with path programs. Okay, so so first of all safety verification state of the art. So why it works? So the, the, the tools, they, they try to handle the complexity that's in, the pr in programs by using theory of abstraction where, where basically what you do, you stop distinguishing between certain collections of sets and then you have theory of abstract interpretation which basically tells you how to map the executions, the concrete executions of the program to the execution, the abstract level and this mapping can be automated using theorem provers and you can compute the right abstraction by looking at the counter examples why the, the abstraction candidate failed. And yeah, as I said, there, there exist these highly successful tools. Some of them are applied in the industry and they are very successful on so-called control intensive properties, which here's an example of such a property. It's actually from Microsoft website. It says that you're not supposed to lower some interrupt request level if you haven't raised it before. And usually this kind of properties you you describe them as some finite state machines. And so brief introduction how these tools work. So we assume a very abstract view on programs. We have a set of states represented by nodes, and these are actually memory configurations. And we have a transition relation between nodes, which is usually represented as program text. And we assume that we are interested in the verification of temporal safety properties. And we go for the simplest one is reachability. We want to show that some set of bad states defects and is not reachable by, by the program runs. And if they are reachable, so then the notion of of, of a bug is a is a finite path from the initial state to, to some bad state in the program. So how we usually prove safety properties, we compute invariants. And invariants are just representations of the of the reachable states of the program. And if the invariant doesn't intersect with the bad states, then we know that the program is safe. So to compute invariance, we can, we can employ an iterat iterative procedure. So we start with the initial states. Those are definitely reachable. And then we unroll the transition relation and get more and more states. Those are reachable in one step and two and so on. And at the limit, we, we compute all reachable states. And unfortunately, this com computation doesn't stop if the number of states that we need to explore is unbounded or very large. So what we do, we do abstraction. And the classical view on abstraction that all these tools take is that you put states together into equivalence classes. And here, we would represent it by boxes. So we assume that all the states within a box, they're in the same equivalence classes. And yeah, and we have some finite partitioning, so finite number of boxes over the state space. So given the Given these boxes, we can map the transition relation of the program into a transition relation which goes over the, over the boxes in standard way. So basically, this is existential abstraction. So whenever you can go from one state in one box to a state in the other box, we do a transition between boxes. And if we have a transition within the box, we have a self-loop. 
So we can compute it symbolically for the, for the whole program using theorem prover, and then we can compute reachability on the abstract states. And, and the, this abstract reachability computation will stop because we have finitely many abstract states to explore. And if you manage to show that the resulting set of boxes doesn't intersect with the bad states, then, then we are done and we know that the property holds. Uh, unfortunately, it can happen that so there is a counterexample, so we're traversing some sequence of, of boxes and enter a bad state. And this is something we call counterexample, and we need to, to analyze if this counterexample is real, which corresponds to a bug, or spurious, which corresponds to some artifact in the abstraction, which, yeah, which leads to this, to this path. If the counterexample is real, then we must be able to, to find the sequence of concrete program states from the initial states to the bad state. And this sequence is reported as a, as a counterexample, as a bug. And otherwise, they, there will be a gap in the sequence. And this gap corresponds to something that we call spurious transition. So basically, a transition that we, can, that we have in the abstract system, but not in the concrete one. And the purpose of refinement is actually to eliminate the, the spurious transitions. Actually, you can view this software model checking tools as tools that eliminate current examples one after the other. So in how we eliminate the, the spurious transition, we just cut the abstract state through the gap. And as we see here, so we, once we did the cut, so we can no longer go from, from left to the right following the refined abstract state space. And this is what's, what's going on in the tools like SLAM and BLAST and many others. And, and, the, and the hope is that using the refined abstraction, we can prove the property. So let me give you a short example, like how this algorithm would work and try to prove a program. So what we want to show in the, in the example is that we, we call the routines that manipulate logs, release and acquire in strict alternation. And uh, here's a simplified version of the program. So we assume an initial abstraction which puts all states at the same location to the same equivalence class. And if we look at the control flow graph of the abstract program, immediately we see that by following this path, going from A to B to C and then to D and exiting the loop, we can have two calls to release in a row. So which means we have a, we have a counterexample. And this is a counterexample that we are going to analyze and to see if it's a bug or we need to refine the abstraction. And counterexample analysis amounts to traversal of, of the path and looking at the program behavior along this path. And then in this particular step from C to D, we observe that the number of packets, since because of the increment statement, is no longer equ equal to the, to the old number of packets. And this is the reason why the transition from D to E cannot be taken. So and our abstraction amounts to abstraction refinement is actually tracking the fact that and packets is equal to the old number of packets. So if we use that predicate to compute a refined abstraction, then we'll see, OK, in the beginning at the location A, we don't know if n is equal to n old. And further, by executing the statements, we will have the, this fact either in positive or in negative. And for the, for the new abstraction, we see that by following this loop, we'll have acquiring release in alternation. And by exiting the loop and calling release, we see that the last uh, locking statement was acquired. So we have alternation on all paths, and we are fine with proving the program. So this was a brief introduction to predicate abstraction and refinement. And unfortunately, this process fails if you have, if you have more complicated arguments for program correctness, for example, here. So if you need the reasoning about arithmetic, then SLAM would give us the first kind of example, not go into the loop. It's, it will tell us, OK, we need to track the fact that x is equal to 0 for not failing the assert, and then 1, and so on and so forth. We'll be just unrolling the loops. And for this program, the, the model check will also unroll the loops by when investigating long and long account example. And then another interesting fact that we observe here is that the model checker will also be looking uh, deeper and deeper into the program memory. So it will look at array positions with larger sequence of indices. And actually, what we, 
what we learned from these two failed attempts is that our refinement procedure to, to be effective needs, needs to have two properties. First, it should symbolically look, look at all possible loop and rollicks at a time. And this way we, will, we, will be, we would be able to handle the first example. And on the other hand, by looking at a single counter example, the refinement procedure should be able to reason about some unbounded object, for example, area of unbounded length to justify, to justify the reason which requires unbounded quantification. And here's the proposal how we suggest to implement such a refinement procedure. What we suggest is, is actually something very simple. Uh, if you have a counter example, which is a sequence of statements in the, in the original program, what we're going to do, we're going to say is that it's not just a single piece of straight light code. We're saying that it has some structure. In particular, it's a traversal of, of program locations. And we can use these program locations to define a control flow, control flow graph and define a, something, which we, which we, something that we call a path program, which basically contains all control locations that are traversed during the along the counter example, and it contains all the transitions that are taken along the counter example. So what we, what we obtain is some, some kind of full-fledged programs with control flow in particular loops. And the, the meaning of the path program for the purpose of refinement is that path program is a, actually a symbolic encoding of some unbounded family of counter examples, unbounded in the case if it contains loops. And one view on it is that if you look at all possible traces of the path program, it gives you all possible unrollings, basically all counterexamples that you might get in the future. And if you look at a single counterexample, which you obtain by following the path program, you can have it of arbitrary length because, again, because the path program contains loops and this is a symbolic description of computation of unbounded length. And another nice feature of path programs is that they the way they are constructed, they are obtained from counterexamples where the model checker thinks that the abstraction is not yet, preci not yet precise enough, so we can think of them as some property guided fragments of the original program. So we can use these path programs to compute refinement in quite a straightforward way. So we go ahead and compute invariants for them. And then we know that if we compute those invariants, then since they hold for arbitrary unrollings of the loop, so they're going to eliminate all possible counterexamples that you obtain by following the path program. And if you look at, at, at these unbounded computations, you can also justify a universal quantification over some, some perm, over, over areas of, of unbounded length. And since the path programs are parts of the original program, so we have some hope that the invariant generation method, those that are precise enough to, to to prove the assertion on the path program that it will scale because we are applying it not on the original program but on some subset of it. And here's an example how it would work. Yeah? So are you saying that so finding a, a path invariant is at least as hard as finding a loop invariant for a path that contains a loop? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So in a sense, you, you are doing a variant generation but on a fragment. And the question is how to find the reasonable fragment. The fragment itself could be an arbitrary program. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So here's a program that takes an array and copies its values to two arrays, the positive ones in the, into the array GE and the negative ones into the array LT. And we can imagine that the first path would be the first counter example would follow the positive branch, and then fail the first assert. And for that one, you can compute and path invariant which only mentions the, the first array. And for, for the complementary counter example, which fails the, the second assert, we can obtain a path invariant reasoning about the LT array. And then the model checker can combine the, the, the two path invariants by taking the predicates that appear there for, for the correctness argument for the, for the whole program. And as we see, the the, the invariant generation becomes the, like the, the crucial part of the abstraction refinement using path invariants. So we need some strong invariant generation methods. And so far, what we had is a 
bunch of algorithms for the invariant generation for numerical domains, but for the purpose of software verification, we need something more. So we need combination of, in, of arithmetic with function symbols, and we want to reason about arrays and about stretches of arrays. And for that, in some previous work, we, we created an algorithm that can generate universally quantified invariants over arrays. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to work through that algorithm and show how we actually do it. And of course, so given this path, in, path program, we can apply any possible methods that are available to compute invariants, ranging from like, constraint-based invariant generation to abstract interpretation or even interactive theorem proving. So, so for, for invariant generation, so the, what we need to do, we need to come up with an assertion that satisfies this condition of being invariant, which means that it contains the initial states, is closed under the, under the next step operation decoded by the program, and it is disjoint from the set of bad states. And our invariant generation algorithm actually generates the, the invariant from a template by encoding the validity of implications in some suitable form, which is then solvable by the constraint solver. And how we do it, so I will show it on the example. Here's a very simple program with, which first initializes an area with zeros and then checks if the elements are zeros. And the, why, it, why it is correct? So if you would reason about it manually, then you would first see that at the, when we are reading from the array in the assert, then the index ranges from 0 to n. Uh, actually to n minus 1. And then we know that since the since i in this case will follow into the premise of the universal quantifier, it's between 0 and n, then we know that at that position the value is 0 and that, that will we can use for to justify the to prove the assert. And the invariant has to n is the most m. Yes, yes, so the should be you, should be n minus one. Hmm? Right. I think the invariant is written is written correctly. No. Uh, L uh, at L2. Ah, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. At L2, it's correctly. But and if you go one step into the assert, then because of the if uh, for condition, yeah, it will be strengthened. Yep. Yeah. And and we can justify that i is actually between zero and n because we have the invariant for the previous loop, which. Oh, no, 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 that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Okay, the question is how we can synthesize this invariance automatically. And so we follow so-called template-based approach. And so the idea is that we can fix the shape of the invariance that we are trying to find. And this particular case, we are saying, okay, since we are looking at since the assert reads from an array and reasons about the array positions and this, the index that it uses to read from the array is modified in the loop, and it, it suggests that we need some universal quantification over that, over that array. And, yeah, and we have some, some guard on the, on, the, on the quantified variable. And we have some, some notation. So basically, if you write this term tin, it means some linear term over the, over the variables i and n. And the question is, find valuation for the, for the coefficients a, for these vectors a, b, and c that determine the, the invariant. Is it clear that the reason invariant of that form? Uh, no. So, so if we expand the, so the, 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 the first line, so what we are looking for is this for all k, something over the values of k, then the transition relation of the loop then implies the, the invariant template with prime variables, yeah? Different question. If there is such a invariant on that form, then will you proceed to find it? Yes, yeah, so we have this property saying that if you can populate the, the template, yeah, so if there is an invariant which, which, is, uh, which, so, uh, which is in the situation of the template, then we'll procedure will find it. Or at least there exist algorithms for, for constraint solving for, for this kind of problem. So, 
whether the implementation will find it is a different question. Um, yeah, so what we need to do to solve, to solve for these parameters is first we need to eliminate the, the array update statement, which we don't know how to reason directly. Then we need to, to find a suitable quantify instantiation. And then after we compiled all that away, we need to encode the, the implication. So in, in the rest, I'm going just through all the steps and show how we, we deal with each of them individually on this example. So removing the universal from the sorry, from the right hand side is quite quite easy because the whole statement is universally quantified, so we just create a fresh variable and and pull the the guard on the other side. So the next step is to removal of the array updates and here we just apply array axiom saying that if we if the position k star from which we are reading is equal to the position where we are writing, then yeah then then what we get at that position in the next step is actually the value that we are that we are writing into it. So this xi will be zero and otherwise the that the value at that position stays the same. And apply it to this to our template means that if i is equal to k star, then we know that we can substitute x prime k star with 0, because we know that's going to be the next value. And otherwise, if they're not equal, so we know that we'll stay the same. So we, we get rid of x prime in our, in our implications. And yeah, that's yeah, highlighting what I just said. And instantiation of the universal quantifier. So we, we see that we need to reason about x k star and to derive something constraining it to C i prime n. And we see that on the left hand side from which we are supposed to derive the restriction, there is no occurrence of, of the term of the array read. And this suggests to us that we actually we need to get the information by, by instantiating the universal quantifier. And how we do it, we do it in two steps. So first we need to to justify the quantified instantiation, basically we need to to prove that k star is between these terms a something and b something, and then once we once we get that, then we can then we can use it. And I think this is supposed to be a k star. So we're actually using the yeah. Sorry, there's a bug on the slides. And justification of the instantiation is also straightforward. So we basically take the whole left hand side and check if it implies that k star is within the bounds. And then we just go and, and, and apply it. And after you do all the steps, so you obtain the constraint system which you can solve and in, for, this, for this small program, so you can solve the constraint system like in some tens of seconds and you obtain the, the following Invariance, and it's it's interesting to to compare it with the invariant that you would propose if you do the manual proof. And actually, so I was really surprised when I was debugging the implementation. So when the when the parameters for the template were suggested, this invariant, so I thought like, why there must be a bug? So because it looks like a more succinct version, and the reason is actually you don't need to reason about about the value of i and n explicitly it's in, in, it's encoded in the premise of the universal quantification and for the second loop you actually care about the values in the array that you that are remained that are that are still to be explored and not those that you have seen that you have already seen so that's that was surprising and so for for slight modification of that example so we can you can see that the the invariant generation procedure it's like more or less robust for this small example, so it's still in order of some tens of seconds. And for, for this big one, it uh, yeah, it, it takes seven seconds to generate all this. And if you actually do the invariant generation by going path by path, by following this path invariance, then actually I think it's like around one second per path. And here we need to reason about about two arrays, so we need to do a lot more work on justifying the quantification and then reasoning about like whether we're updating 
the position we are looking at or something else. And yeah. Throw away a big portion of the program that's mm -hmm. irrelevant to the calculus. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, and the goodness of that is, is that uh, you will get uh, better uh, performance in, in your uh, invariant generation. Mm -hmm. okay. Unfortunately, what what I cannot present so far is actually how it, I mean this whole path invariance only makes sense if you have a big program with some small reason of complicated part of it where you actually need to do precise and but expensive reasoning. But since like here I'm on actually more interested in like this invariant generation on, on its own, so the example don't really show off the advantage of path invariant. Okay. Yeah. And it's like how often it is that when you work on one loop it it's stays low because it's a Ah, so the actual this this the motivation for path invariance comes from the work on terminator, where we're using SLAM to compute fixed points for 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 termination proofs, and SLAM was working very nice for for device drivers. But once you need to add reason about counters for 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 the ranking functions, it was yeah. So it was going in some infinite refinement loop, and there we saw that actually the loops that you need to look at are really small. And if you would have the precise reason only for that part of the code, then we would be fine with all these examples. So, and that's where it comes from. But of course, if, you are, if the reason, if the correctness reason is complicated and scattered over the whole program, then the resulting path program will, will basically be your original program, and then it, it won't help. Just to be clear, so in this case, for example, those invariants that you show there, those were synthesized from some uh, from some sketch or from some skeleton of how yeah, from templates, yeah. should uh, look like. So how much uh, in this other examples? How much did you uh, how much did you have to specify? How much? Uh, you need to specify templates, and basically, what does it mean? You need to like give dimensions for the boolean structure, how many conjuncts and disjuncts, and you must be very careful with disjuncts because the constraint systems they they grow really fast in the number of disjuncts. And what you might also ask is like, uh, who gives me the templates? But the, the answer here is the design space for templates is actually very small. So for those, you can just go and try them like one after the other. Well, I think more, I mean, if you can actually go and try them uh, one by one, then you don't really need the template, right? It's really more a question of you the user has some insight as to how this is going to look like, and the user provides that in the template, right? Uh, maybe, or yeah, or you develop the verification tool and specialize it to some some particular class of programs, and then you say, okay, this sh should be the templates. Yeah. Um, okay. So this, yeah. So we we managed to to. Be able, so we are able to verify some examples which are quite compact but have all the all, all the difficulties that make the current generation of the software model checkers just spin forever in the refinement loop and so so there is a implementation of this invariant generation for universally quantified array property fragment and of course the so as you can imagine so the constraint system grow really fast and so there are many interesting directions how we can prove the prune the the case splitting that arises in, in that reasoning. And one of the directions is that we're looking now is actually to set up the constraint systems and also try to execute the program. And then from concrete program runs, from from tests, uh, derive facts that you can conjoin to the constraint system to to, to, to simplify it. So using some some online constraint solver, so that's what we are currently looking at. And to can yeah. Any complexity analysis related to this promising running time? Complexity analysis. So basically, so the the complexity is really bad. And so the first step of this invariant generation algorithm. So basically, we we have invariant generation for linear arithmetic. Then the 
we extend it with function symbols, and then we extend it with universal quantification. So basically, handling arrays compiles down to arithmetic plus function symbols, com com goes down to arithmetic. And the step from, from function symbols plus arithmetic to arithmetic, so basically you, what you need to do, you need to guess which of the axiom instances, the functionality axioms, which of them fire. And you can imagine, like, you need basically to enumerate all the proofs in the worst case. And if the number of symbols is n, then you have n square axioms, and then you need to take permutations over subsets. But, so what we observed on these examples is that at most we had to fire three axioms to, to find the parameters that give the proof. And another source of complexity is that when solving invariant generation problem for for arithmetic, actually we need to solve constraints that are nonlinear. So they are not so they are parametric linear in the sense that we multiply variables from two disjoint sets. And why it it scales so far is that variables in one set in the sense they encode proofs. And for this proofs we so usually the, the so basically the the values for, for those coefficients are really small, so they are either zeros or ones. So basically t saying, okay, this inequality participates in the derivation or not. But in, in, in general, yeah, it, it, it's also very expensive, yeah? Um, these experiments, if you do them in an own uh, tool development, or is this um, a kind of plug-in to an existing tool, or how is it actually implemented and used for this kind of experiments? Oh, it's a, it's a basically copy and paste interface to Emacs, and there is a Sixtus prolog uh, running in uh, the interpreter running in Emacs, and you basically need to translate manually from from your transition relation to the term description of of it. Oh, so it's just a conceptual. Tool. No, the the tool is real, mm -hmm. but uh, so there are no usable interfaces for somebody outside. But if you if you're interested, I can give you a demo. And, and so it's not integrated in a more general system or something? Uh, no, you don't, not, not yet. Do you consider uh, actually examples where the overall um, approach makes actually the performance of the tool worse? So this is... Uh, of which tool? Huh? The performance of the tool, what is the tool? Well, the, uh, the verification tool that you use to make this kind of experiment. So it could also be, for example, that some experiments would uh, work better without this, this kind of abstractions. Um, so how is the, the integration aspect here? So the idea is, of course, that you have something very expensive, mm -hmm. yeah, like this environment generation, and you have something cheap like computing predicates using weakest preconditions or interpolants. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And what you can do is actually, you, and since we have multi-core workstations now, you can say, okay, I have my refinement loop the standard one, and then just following that loop. And on the side, I, uh, I'm having the invariant generation for path program. Yeah, and if it succeeds, I just like take the predicates from there. And since I know that they eliminate all possible counterexamples, those that I have seen so far until until it came back, and also the next ones, I just throw away the previous ones and put in. So that I think that would be the integration. Because of course you cannot rely on this method. Because by by some by some luck you can get just the right predicates from interpolants, and you'd rather not wait for the for the expensive invariant generation. And yeah. Is so the problem that this is something decidable? Uh, for that particular fragment, yes. It is decidable, so you you don't have the two counter machine problem. No, not solving no. That. No, of course. Uh, depending on the language in, of the templates, yeah, you can you can a actually synthesize invariance over the logic where the implication is not decidable, uh, but then you won't be complete. So so we are sound, but in some you, they will just lose completeness. So the invariant generator will say, okay, I cannot find the proof, and so yeah, I cannot instantiate the parameters. But although there there exist an invariant expressible by the template. But in, in that particular case, this universal quantification over arrays where the guard and error reads are of particular form, so it is, it is decidable, yeah. This is result by, 
Bradley, Mana, and Sigma, I think, 2005 or six. But you can, so basically in that fragment you cannot do induction. So, so you you are not. So if I assume like X is universally quantified variable, you can use it for indexing into the array using it only as a top symbol. So you cannot write X plus one for for the position, because otherwise you encode induction and it becomes undecidable. Yeah. Okay. How hard is this to develop these uh, templates? Is this a task that the design of the tool has to do, or could actually uh, a programmer sort of spending from the knowledge that he has over the problem domain design such kind of templates? No, as I said, so design space for templates is, is actually not that rich. Yeah. So if you if you want to your tool to be completely automatic, you can you can probably run very shallow static analysis. That will suggest, okay, in this case, since you are trying to read from the array in the, your search statement and the index that you're reading changes in the loop, so probably you need some quantification. Yeah, and otherwise you, you don't have universal quantification in the template. And for, that's for the, for quantifiers and for, for the number of conjuncts in the invariant, actually, so the tool says no really quickly. So basically, you can start with one conjunct. If it fails, then add more conjuncts as you need. And of, of course, for, for the user, it, it will be very easy. So again, since the design space is so compact, you say like one, two, three, or I many. What, what's his feeling? Yeah. So sort of a related question: How, how flexible is your system that is able to fill out this uh, holes and the templates? If I like, if I have some new uh, invariant that I that I believe my loop should satisfy, and that uh, can I just write a template that is uh, very different from the ones you've showed me, and will that uh, work? Uh, very different in depends on like what do you mean by very different. So you can easily add conjuncts and and some more expressions into it. You you cannot uh, like go outside of the. Of the of this area property fragment, if you want to to remain completeness, and what you can also do, if you're using it in in some interactive setting, mm -hmm. so since we since we're using some online constraint solvers, you can actually you can set up the constraint system automatically from your templates, and then you can say, okay, I, I want to do some case analysis by hand, so basically you say, okay, I assume that the coefficient for x should be positive, and you can just uh, can join it with the kind of constraint store, and if if it becomes if it's still satisfiable, you can like try further choices, or it will fail, and then you can backtrack to the previous context, and this is also possible. Okay, and so the to conclude, so we believe that path invariants they they actually shift focus in so in in abstraction discovery. In some, in in a way such that, what we had before, we had methods that employ different heuristics to find the the right set of predicates, and if we use path invariance, then then what we need to do, we, we just need to find information efficiently, and if we manage to do that, we know that it's it's it has the the desired it has the desired properties, so we we find the relevant information, so basically we go from. Yeah, from heuristic about like what what to pick f to heuristics like how to 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 pick the right thing very very fast, and another interesting property of this path invariant based approach is that since it's parameterized by the invariant generator, it it allows you to use all the program analysis methods that compute invariants in some in some modular fashion and just take everything. That's out there, all the best tools, and, and apply them and put them together in, 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 in a single powerful tool. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Does that actually fit into 
have to slam in the in the Terminator? Uh, no, 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 no. It's it's. So, a, but the but the examples were inspired from. Yeah. Such, yeah. Example. Yeah, and the next step is yeah to make it communicate with with Blast or Slam, and actually there is also interesting work by by Blast people where they do this thing called buff slicing. So basically, if you ever count the example, the length of one, so you can pre-process it in such a way such that if, if the path formula was satisfiable, the, then the result of pre-process will, will still be satisfiable in other way around. If it was unsat, it will remain unsat, but it prunes a lot from, prunes a lot of information from that path, which, which translated to, to path program like makes it easier to, to verify. So. That's uh, something we want to explore more. Yeah. It's a, do you have so, like for instance, in device drivers, etc. Is it? I don't know how how familiar you are with that code. It's kind of. But do you think there is uh, there is some hope that most of the loops in there are pretty? It's almost always the same pattern going on, and that one day we'll have a tool that I mean, or maybe already, but uh, that we really go through these loops and somehow do a good job like 80% of the time by using some of these templates? Or or no, I'm really overlooking the complexity of what's going on there because they are, it's really more complicated than that. Or do you have any thought about that? Yeah, so from the experience with Terminator, I think we rarely saw nested loops. And for those that we saw... In what code? In, 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 in drivers. Yeah, or probably, yeah. In, in drivers that we have from in the in this uh, SDV environment, the, the for the benchmarks, and yeah, which like first yes to to your like 80% success, and the other yes to this 80% success hypothesis is that since the since the termination proofs went through quite easily, and the ranking functions were over one or at most two variables. Which means that the this the inductive hypothesis that drives the correctness of the loop is is actually quite simple and the 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 question is like you need you need some precise methods not overly sophisticated but precise for like for this like one two variable per 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 assertion and but the, the only question is like where to apply them you cannot apply them on the whole program but if you manage to find find the loop on which to to Hermit, then, then I think you're fine and you get the 80%. But then, but then you say 80, like in the, 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 if you do a static analysis of these device drivers, you can isolate loops, you can count how many of them they are, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're saying that when, so you're not talking about the entire set there of loops, you're talking about those that were somehow for in Terminator, you were also computing an abstraction to prove likeness property, yeah. and then you encountered a subset of these loops, and then for those it was easy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't want to diminish your, the merit of your work, but okay, you managed to go through those. So those were how many, of, what percentage of the entire number of loops in the total amount of code there? Was it a small percentage, or? No, I, sorry, I mean? sorry I, 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 you lost me somewhere on the way of, of, of classifying loops. Could you please repeat the question? So, uh, so are you saying that uh, you say that mo when you do your Terminator work, most loops, 80%, whatever, you had, you could find basically, uh, uh, you could prove termination of those loops using like ranking function with one or two parameters. You say? Yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so for most of these loops, you mean if I do a static analysis of these drivers and I count how many loops they are. 80% of those fits that? You can prove termination yeah. is one, that's what you say? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And of course, another question is like if you, what you can do, you can just take those loops in isolation without all the context. But in many cases, I think you will succeed. But also in many cases, you, you need a bit of context information. So you know that are like some package struct that comes to that loop. And when you like take in the counter, from some field of this, like you need to know that it's not zero, and this information you need to derive. But I also think that for many of them, you just take the code and treat it in isolation, and you'll be fine. Okay. 
Thank you.